Today's episode is with Mark Sheverton. He told me that he wrote the books because he wanted other kids to realize that they're not alone. Tune in with me as we discuss what prompted him to go down and write over 27 novels, especially for kids. Welcome to Casa de Confidence, a podcast for you. You'll hear some incredible women and some awesome cool dudes going confidently in the direction of their dreams and living in the purpose of their heart. You're our host, Julie DeLuca Collins, and you are our sidekick, hashtag handsome hot husband, that again, and the producer of the show, that I am. I am an author, speaker, coach, dreamer, and most of all, we help people go in the direction of their dreams and support them on their purpose. So pull up a chair, grab a drink, and make yourself at home because our casa is your casa. Good morning, everybody. This is Dan, and I am welcoming you back to another week of Casa de Confidence. Hi, Julie. Hi, and this is Julie, the talk part of the duo today. And happy Easter for those who celebrate. And I know that we should not be talking about that because, well, um, it turns out to be like not evergreen content when we say the date <laughs> and we record <laughs> this. But, oh, well, it's happy Easter, it. anybody. It it's is worth, worth a it. mention. Hey, happy Easter, Daniel. Happy Easter, Julie. What are you drinking? Uh, coffee. I am drinking tea. You know why? Because, and by the way, for those who don't know and haven't figured it out, we are not together. Well, we mm. are in the Zoom, but not together in the same room. We are in different states right now. Julie's in Florida and I'm home in Connecticut. Yes. And I am visiting my niece, Amelia. And mm. she has a brand new puppy. His name is Winston. Adorable. But I think I'm allergic to him. Or I'm allergic to the mango and the avocado trees that seem to be blooming because I'm losing my voice and I have um, my eyes keep like growing in itchiness and all kinds of craziness. <laughs> you may just be allergic to Florida. I think I am allergic to Florida. <laughs> There's no way we're moving back here, by the way. <laughs> we both no offense. No offense to the people who live in Florida. We love no, it's, you. It's wonderful. Just I, and I like the beach. I don't think it's you. You don't think it's me? I, I don't I don't think it's it's not your vibe. No, it's Miami not my vibe. vibe. It's a wonderful place. It's an amazing thing. Hey, by the way though, yesterday we took a little um, Even though okay. you grew up there. Yes. We took a little trip. My sister and my niece and I, we went to dinner. We went to a Korean barbecue where you like cook your own meat. Mm. It was a nice experience, but I have to tell you, I was reminded that I'd rather have people just cook my food and bring it cook. Mm. I, I, did, I cannot believe that I paid to cook my own meal. Mm. Not not my cup of tea. Well, it's kind of like fondue. Same thing. Yeah. And by the way, we did get cheese for the broccoli and it, it would never melt. It was ridiculous. I'm like, mm. are you kidding me? Anyhow. At any rate, after we did that, um, the restaurant is near where we went to high school. So we took a little trip down memory lane and I went by my old high school, my alma mater, Palmetto High, and I could not recognize it. it really? Was, all the buildings are new and where we had the senior patio, where I had many of my lunches with my friends. <laughs> um, we would sit out in the senior patio and have a little picnic. Um, yeah, that was not there. It's a building. And then I went to um, the student parking lot because, you know, many good memories there, too. And not, no parking lot there either. Another building. <clears throat> mm. Anyhow. The football field still in the same place? Football field still in the same place. Well, that's kind of got history on it so right mm, um, i don't know about that nfl players come out came out of your high school they did yeah oh, I, I, I did not know that <laughs> it's not just nikki taylor who's nikki taylor nikki taylor the model oh see you know this is how dan and i talk about this dan remembers that my high school has nikki taylor the model 
I, on the other hand, know that Jeff Bezos and our Supreme Court Justice, Ketanji Brown, came from my high school, which, by the way, I had a class with Ketanji Brown, which she's lovely. And what you see is what you get. She's always been a a very wonderful, caring person. Mm -hmm. Anyway, today, today's. You know what my high school had? You. Uh, We had an airport and a rifle range on the same Mm -hmm. property, surrounded by a cross country course. Wow. That's that's think about it. Airport, yeah, that's nice. Airport and Mm right range, yeah. And the in the cross country course went around it. Mm. Did you a lot of a lot of conflicting things can't happen at the same time. (laughs) So yeah, you know because with the way you make it sound is that Uh if you have a rifle range and people are running in the cross country course, you could be Mm -hmm. getting shot at. Well, you, you add the airport to it. <laughs> oh, Lord. <sighs> anyway, I, I, yeah, nice. I like being able to tell the story that. Okay, wait a minute. My, my high school had an airport, and yeah. And that's kind of usually I, most other high schools don't have that. Listen, I have an embarrassing story, though, about uh, my last night activities. I am. After we left dinner and we drove around, we went to one of the, I used to work there. Um, It's called the Falls Shopping Center. And it's a beautiful shopping center that's kind of outdoors and throughout the mall itself in the middle of the mall. I saw a Jurassic Park there. Okay. Well, they have these waterfalls. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, so my sister was kind of annoyed that we were shopping and Amelia and I are like, oh, let's go in this store. Oh, let's go in this store. And my (laughs) sister's kind of rolling her eyes at the two of us because we, Amelia and I tend to be two peas in a pod. And then all of a sudden it was like, I have to go to the bathroom. Like I really, like apparently I drank a lot and I had to go to the bathroom and the place where the bathroom, the public bathrooms were in the mall was not there anymore. And I was like, where are the bathrooms? So I asked someone, excuse me, where are the bathrooms? They're like, the closest thing you can do is go to the movie theater, to the bathrooms. Yeah. So of course a Saturday night and you know, I go to the bathrooms in the movie theater and then all of a sudden I find myself, first of all, the bathrooms were less than clean. Needless mm-hmm. to say, I was not happy, but I was like rushing. And um, I thought I was going to have a major accident in my hands because I was just like, it was that moment that it was dire needs, right? So I mm-hmm. run in and I'm running. And then the first stall is dirty. The second one is dirty. Then the third one is even more dirty. And now I'm gagging, but I can't mm-hmm. help it. And I need to go. And Anyway, so finally, I went into the last stall in the room, and I go in, (laughs) and I'm wearing... I'm wearing a jumper with the zipper in the back. And then you see me trying to dance, trying to not. And then I'm like shedding my little shrug. And then I'm like trying to undo the zipper and I'm doing the dance and I'm jumping up and down and I'm trying not to pee. And the next thing you know, I sit down and I finally go to the bathroom. Well, I didn't really sit down because it was pretty gross, but I, mm-hmm. and I'm, sit, I'm there. And then all of a sudden I went to finish my business just to find that there is no toilet paper in the stall. And I am in the only person in the bathroom (laughs) so i'm like oh my gosh okay so i'm gonna wait two minutes someone's gonna come in because it's saturday night this is crowded nope nothing 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 finally i decide okay i gotta call my sister and by the way i typically have at least some kleenex or whatever in my purse but i had a a little tiny purse so it didn't have any room to Mm -hmm. stick anything in there um so i called my sister And I'm like, excuse me, I'm having some technical difficulties here. And she's laughing at me. And then she just hangs up and she's laughing at me. Nothing like she's coming in to save me or anything. And then she says, I'm in Starbucks. You're going to have to wait. (laughs) Are you kidding me? Who goes to Starbucks at 8 o'clock at night? Anyhow, but I digress. Well, not you, but other people not drink caffeine sure. at night. You're right. So anyway, so then I'm like sitting there and I'm waiting and waiting. And the next thing you know, my niece comes in and she she's like, I found you because of your shoes. Because <laughs> I was wearing bright red shoes with <laughs> bows on them. <laughs> and then she's like, here you go. And she hands me three. I counted them. Three little squares. And proceeds <laughs> to leave the bathroom. I was like... This is not even going to do like 
part of the job, much mm-hmm. less the entire job. And then I'm like, Amelia. And she's like, what? I'm like, this is not going to be enough. She's like, why not? I'm like, mm. oh my gosh, do I need to even explain this to you? So anyway, so then she hands me what she thought it was more adequate. And I thought, okay, are you really kidding me? Anyway, teenagers. Well, she's not a teen yet, but definitely she like walked out. And then I found myself trying to put my jumper back on and I could not sit myself up. (laughs) Anyhow, that was my adventure last night. And then, of course, I came out and both her and my sister were laughing at me because that's what family does. Of course they were. Hey, would you? (laughs) That is what family does. That's what they're. Hey, that's what everyone is here for. Mm -hmm. It's a funny experience. Now, would you rather, would you rather go through that experience? Mm hmm. Or realize while you're walking on a trail and you have to go and it's impending doom and you have to poop outside with leaves. Um, Definitely not leaves. You'd rather have somebody rescue you in the bathroom. Yes, for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. There is a video out there of this incident. Kind of. It's not out there. It's on my hard drive. <laughs> Oh my there is friend. no video, Daniel. There is a video. Julie did not go. No, I did not nature. go to the bathroom in nature. But she did. She did do. Ran the, home. She I did ran do home. The poopy walk for like two miles. Why would you call it the poopy walk? Poopy oh walk. God. You kind of walk like a duck trying to hold, you know, your eggs in or something. I thought I was it's, going to die. <laughs> it was on the trail here by our house when we yeah. were. When we were getting our walks in for the Camino. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, just, yeah, I think this was day. after the Camino. Uh, mm, I don't know. I don't we'll know. see. I look at the was, date in the video. I don't think I've walked since the Camino. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think this is when I came back from my first Camino trip. Oh, it might have been. Yeah. So I, I have to tell yeah. you another story. And I don't think that I told you the whole story yesterday. But in the morning, <clears throat> my niece Amelia was sleeping a little late. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know, and it's she's on vacation. And it was Saturday morning. And I waited for her. And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> Screw this. I'm going to go to the pool. I came here to Florida to be outside and to be at the pool, not sitting inside waiting for this child. Anyway, so just as I'm about to leave, she wakes up. And I said, hey, I'm going to the pool. Get dressed. And she's like, I don't want to go. I'm like, just get dressed. Anyhow, I, I'm like, get dressed. Put your bathing suit on. Let's go. She's like, I'm not going swimming. But she decides she's going with me. Mm-hmm. And then my sister's like, all right, well, you guys are going to have to walk there because I'm not taking you. I'm like, are you kidding me? It's like the public pool in her complex, right? I'm like, fine. I don't care. So we go. So and here's Amelia. Public, right? Yeah, so here's Amelia wearing her um, little cute pants. They're like checkered pants with a, che- with a striped shirt. And she's just walking with me, kind of annoyed that I'm making her come to the pool with me, right? <laughs> and we get to the pool, and it's like the little pool, not the big one where the clubhouse is. And as we get in, um, there are two young girls, not young, but you know, I could tell they were in high school and they were sunning themselves. And I could tell Amelia kind of like felt a little apprehensive as we went in. And I just go in, I'm like, hi. And then I put my stuff down and then I take my clothes off and I go in the water and my bathing suit. And Amelia is like, and it was so gorgeous, Dan. It was amazing, perfect pool weather. And then Amelia's like, Oh, can I dip my toes in the water? And I said, I told you to be in your bathing suit. And she's like, no, no, I can't go swimming. And she's like, but I'll dip my toes in the water. So then she dips her toes in the water. And then she's like, wait a minute. I need to, maybe I'll roll my pants up. <laughs> and then the next thing you know, she's getting her pants all um, wet and whatnot. And then I'm like, why don't you just call your mom and say, bring me a bathing suit? And she's like, no, no. Finally, she gets a bathing suit. My sister brings her a bathing suit. And while she's changing, the two young women that were there said, hey, do you guys want to pick a song for the radio? And then we can play a song that you guys want. I'm like, sure. Why don't you ask my niece? Right. Hmm. And anyway, so they asked her. And when she came back and the next thing you know, these two, there were freshmen in high school. These two young women were amazing. Okay. Amazing. Because 
the reality is that it's not easy. You know, you have your friends and sometimes you're not included and this is not unique to my knees. Um, but these two ladies, young women went out of their own way to just talk to my niece who's in fifth grade and tell her how beautiful she was and lift her up. And I think that we need more of girls that lift other girls up, which is very apropos for today's uh, interview because Mark Sheverton um, wrote the books that he, he wrote, right? He, he began writing his books because New York bestseller. He, yes. And his Mm. son, his books are for young adults, seven to 13, but this is his journey from being a classroom teacher to now inspiring others and specifically giving kids that are being bullied choice and helping them deal with anxiety. And you know, the reality is that it doesn't stop. Many of us have been bullied as kids and we all won't always fit in, but it's important to find our strength and to find that we can cope and to find that there is a journey to healing. And hopefully along the line, you are going to meet some incredible people like these two young women, Mariana and Jasmine, who are kind and loving and remind you the greatness inside of you. And I I was so touched and motivated by how wonderful these two girls who we've never met out of the blue decided to just reach out to a fifth grader and tell her that she was beautiful. She was cool, that she shouldn't, um, you know, not worry about having, you know, when people are mean to her, not to worry about that. And that was very refreshing. So I love that. Amazing. Yeah. So it was an incredible experience and it gave my niece a little boost of confidence. So Mm. shout out to those two young ladies who, by the way, made a good TikTok and I reshared it on TikTok because they're so cute. (laughs) (laughs) They were filming the TikTok after they talked to us for a while. That's amazing that, that early in life, they've learned to be that generous with their positivity. Yeah, I love that. And by the way, again, Mark Sheverton, the catalyst for his breakthrough novel was his desire to help his son understand and overcome cyberbullying. And this personal mission blossomed into the best selling series that touched the hearts of so many other kids that perhaps um, have been in this unfortunate situation. The magic of Minecraft is really what the book is connected to. So I encourage you to check out Mark, listen to this interview and share these with the kids in your life. All right. So on to the interview with Mark Jefferson and Julie DeLuca Collins. Hi, everybody. I am excited to have this new interview for you today. I have an author and, you know, I love hosting authors in Casa de Confidence. Uh, Mark Sheverton is formerly a high school math and physics teacher. He has written 27 action adventure novels for kids age three, uh, I'm sorry, seven to 13. These mm-hmm. books have appeared on the New York Times USA Today Uh, bestseller list and published weekly and have been published in 31 countries across the globe and are over 2 million copies in print. His latest book, Facing the Beast Within, will be his 27th novel and deals with anxiety in kids. So this is an important conversation. I am thrilled to welcome Mark to the show. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Julie. I'm glad to be here. I am, uh, again, uh, just so thrilled to be able to speak to a teacher um, because not only are you doing something really fun, which is as an author, living the life of an author, you are also continuing to be a teacher. Uh, But tell me a little bit more about you. What were you like in school when you were 7 to 13, just like your readers? (laughs) I was, I don't know why this is, and I use this line in many of my books, I was like a mouse hiding in the corner with a room full of cats. Really? I was the scared kid. I was always afraid I was going to get beat up. 
Mm. Even if nobody noticed me because I was the invisible kid that no one really noticed. But I think that was maybe my anxiety. Yeah. I don't it, know what it, that came it is from. Sometimes, right? Um, it's so, our perception of the world. Yeah. It's really funny when I, I never thought of it until I wrote this book about anxiety. And mm-hmm. I started writing the symptoms that the character was showing. And I was thinking, hey, wait a minute. That was me. <laughs> that was you. Isn't it interesting that in anything that we put out into the world when we're being creative, there's always a little bit of us and sometimes more than others, right? Yeah. And I, I think it goes to show the power of writing, mm-hmm. how, you know, writing and journaling, how healing and how revealing that can be for the person doing the writing. Yeah, absolutely. I think that for me, you know, writing has definitely been the one thing over the years that has gotten me through. And at times I resisted, right? Um, because, you know, I I, I want to stay in, like my friend, uh, Corinne, uh, she's a coach and she talks about when we want to stay in our dirty diaper and not change their feelings and see what we're <laughs> feeling, you know? Um, yeah. But uh, I'm so, I, I, I'm so intrigued by, you know, how did you go from being a teacher and uh, then shifting to this new life and as an author. And again, you, you're you um, writing some incredible work that is getting kids to read. How, what was the transition? And did you well, always know you wanted to be a writer? Oh, I never knew I wanted to be a writer. In fact, I, I wrote my first story when I was like 14 or 15. Mm-hmm. I was on a bus trip for school somewhere. Okay. And I wrote it and then I never finished it because I didn't know how and I was afraid to show it to anybody. And so I gave up and I never pursued that, which Mm -hmm. was unfortunate. Um, But my transition was not only from being a teacher to an author. I went from a teacher. I taught for 15 years and then moved into industry and I worked as a physicist for another 15 years. Then I became a child author. So it's an even stranger transition. Interesting. You know, I I love hearing about these uh, twists and turns in the journey that people take. Um, and now you really are a, an, a, an, a, an award-winning author. You've been awarded with the Mom's Choice Award, um, yep. honoring excellence, the International Book Awards, the NYC uh, Big Book Award, and again, Reader's Favorite Five Stars, the SIPA EV Book Award. And what how how did you get here what did you set out to be an award winning writer um in <laughs> well, the new york times bestseller list yeah. and Everybody what's the inspiration does, but... yeah well so, of course yeah. <laughs> so but but nobody thinks it's going to happen right yeah so i started writing when my son was about 3 years old or so mm-hmm. and i was working at ge as a physicist mm-hmm. and i see the people who are really successful are the ones that are willing to take risks. They're willing to try something really hard, mm-hmm. even though they might fail. They're still yeah. going to try it anyways. And they seem to be successful. I don't know how that is. But my son's never going to learn that from me because we learn from our parents by watching them. Right, right. And taking big risks and trying things that they're likely going to fail at, those don't describe me at all. Okay. <laughs> so my son's not going to see that. So uh-huh. I thought maybe if I write some books, and the characters show that, and the mm-hmm. characters are really good, and the story is really good. My son will read that, and he'll get it from there, maybe. Mm-hmm. So I started writing. I wrote a science fiction novel, tried to get it published. It was a catastrophic failure. <laughs> okay. It was rejected. My son, at when I finished it, my son was learning how to graph in school, so he was graphing all of my rejections. Wow. <laughs> and so he thought this was a fun exercise. I right. didn't like his graph because we got to 253 rejections. Wow. And that's when I said, okay, let's put this one to bed. Okay. This is clearly a failure. Then I wrote three more. And those okay. next three were the same thing, just catastrophic failures. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to get published when you're not published because people yeah. don't want to take a risk. Yeah, no, Absolutely. Um, and and you have to have the right product and you have to have the right kind of writing. And I was still learning how to write. Mm-hmm. Um, but after four failed books, I was ready to give up. And Did you have an son, agent? 
I didn't yet. Okay. So, so that's what I was trying to get was an agent. Yeah. Okay. And you know, I and I think my letter I send to agents, I was writing like a physicist making a technical report, gotcha. not a flowery piece of of literature. Yeah, I'm a flowery writer for sure. Yeah. I had a boss once tell me that. It's like you can't write like that. And I thought, yeah. well, this is me. This is how I write. I'm flowery. Yeah. <laughs> and I had experiences writing a, as a physicist. Oh, and right. so you know, but my novels weren't like that. Mm-hmm. But, okay. When I write a letter to the editor, I was or to the literary agent, I was conveying information. So I shifted into scientist mode. Yeah, of course. So I was ready to give up. And then my son's playing Minecraft and he has his own server so kids can play with him. Mm-hmm. And he was cyberbullied while he was doing this. Wow. And it was pretty traumatic. Yeah. And he said to me, Dad, what did I do wrong mm. to make this happen? I treated these boys nice. Yeah. What did I do to deserve this? Wow. And I learned later after learning about bullying that that's really common that victims of bullying mm-hmm. think they they deserved it. They did something wrong. Yeah. yeah. And so Absolutely. I tried to tell him it wasn't his fault. He didn't get it. So I thought, well, I'm going to write a book to teach him what kind of person mm-hmm. would do this and why it wasn't his fault. And I'm going to set it in Minecraft because he's obsessed with Minecraft. Right. Okay. And then we read it at bedtime. Mm-hmm. And he got it. He said, these kids are jerks. Yeah. They're probably being bullied at home. And this is how they're lashing out. Wow. And I thought I should get super dad of the month, I think, for this. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I think that um, there's so many different things here happening. Um, I I want to go back before I really comment on this. And I, I want to say that, um, by the way, you became the person that you were admiring at G because you weren't giving up on your dreams well, and you were that's taking the risks. irony of the whole thing, right? Yes. <laughs> I, I do want to say that. that you became this yeah. risk taker yeah, and that later. you had failures behind you, but you yeah. you knew what you wanted to do. And I think that this is so interesting. And then you, you know, this is the the piece that I think sometimes people miss. And by the way, I've missed it many times in my life. But when we are in failure, it's very important to ask the right question. How can I, right? And continue to pursue the passion and pursue our purpose. And you found your purpose in creating something that would help your son. Right. Yeah. So so he we read it. He really liked it. I thought, yeah, you know, I'm going to try to get it published. But I'm not going to try to get an agent because I've taught mm-hmm. myself that I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> so I saw, and you know, so I have a lot of data there to say that was the right choice. Not right. Okay. So I self published it on Amazon just for fun. I made this terrible cover. I am not an artist and put it up on there. And it kind of floundered around for a while. I found somebody to make to an artist to make me a cover for 50 bucks. Yeah. And I did that. And then I just ignored it. And all of a sudden, it sold 50,000 copies. Wow. And it's number 29 on Amazon's top 100. Oh, my like, gosh. Holy crap. So now publishers and agents were calling me. Mm-hmm. And they're saying, do you want to traditionally publish? And I said, yeah. And so wow. I got a contract for a series and another series and another series. And I ended up writing 24 books all set in Minecraft. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a world. And now I, I know that we probably have some listeners here that are not quite sure what my Minecraft is. Perhaps they don't have kids and have never been around this world. I'd love for you to share a little bit of what, um, what it is. What is Minecraft? So Minecraft, they call it a sandbox game because there isn't really a goal. Mm-hmm. It's an area where everything's made out of blocks and you can build anything you want. You can go, you can build a castle, you can go dig for iron and make iron armor and then go fight monsters. Mm. Um, you can go dig for diamond and make diamond armor. That's the big thing to get because then you're really strong and you can go yeah. fight the dragon in another world and try to survive. Um, but a lot of kids use it just for role play. They go on there. Mm-hmm. Teachers use it in the classroom for teaching. Yeah. Amazing. Um, but That's it is so super popular. Something like two or 300 million people 
yeah. have bought the game and play it. And it's just well, amazing. It's amazing. And I, I, you know, I, I, I have several, uh, you know, my, my friends, kids have played Minecraft, but it's such an incredible world. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and, and there's so much that um, can be done um, when it comes to how you can incorporate it. And what amazing teachers that actually take something that the kids really um, love and incorporate it and make it into a teaching moment. Right. So I, I ran into one teacher who started using Minecraft for book reports. Amazing. And kids would build a scene from the story mm -hmm. and then they would do a presentation wow. while they're in Minecraft showing everybody what they built. And they mm -hmm. would put more effort and and present more information this way than they would have in a one page book right. report. Wow. It's Amazing. Just, it's, it's interesting. It's so super interesting. So now, you know, what happened with your son after he read the books and was being bullied and how did he kind of overcome? How did you help him navigate that? So, you know, he saw, okay, I'm being bullied. It's not my fault. Mm -hmm. um, he learned the lesson of he invited everybody in the internet to come join his server. Mm -hmm. And in hindsight, that was probably a huge mistake. Yes. There's a lot of mean people on the internet. Yeah, the internet is unforgiving at times. Yeah. And so, and we also didn't know anything about how to block people from coming on to the server. Mm -hmm. And we should have spent more time learning about how to run a server rather than just throw it together and dive in and mm. invite the whole world. Yeah, yeah. Because there are security things that can block kids from doing those things. Mm -hmm. And there's plugins yeah. you can get to add to Minecraft to make it more secure so kids can't do these things. Right, right. And we Absolutely. were just ignorant. And we didn't know any better. Mm. Um, but he realized that bullying is not about him. It's typically about the bullier. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this is one of the things that people don't understand. You you typically think the bully is sitting around, you know, uh, feeling um, all mighty and powerful. But it really is not about that. It really is about them uh, being bullied and, and experiencing because children learn what they live. And yep. typically, you know, this is the, a, a normal um, progression, I think. And it definitely is something that uh, parents should be aware of. Now, when when your son read the book and you realized that this is something that was definitely going to kind of resonate, what was your next step? How did you well, get it together I, to get published? I, I had no idea that this was going to resonate. Mm -hmm. I just I had learned about self-publishing and I thought, hey, what the heck? I'll do it anyways. Mm. And so I kind of put it up there myself. And the first reviews were brutal because there were a lot of typos. Yeah. There was a of lot course. of formatting issues with the <laughs> book. And yeah. I didn't understand that you got to be really careful. I didn't understand the trick that most professional authors use. And that is they read their book out loud to themselves mm. before wow. uh, as the last draft. Mm -hmm. Because when you're reading, you skip over those little construction words. Yeah, You know, it's, it says at, but your brain says as, because that's what fits. Right, exactly. <laughs> but when you read it out loud, you tend to speak the word that's on the page and you catch those typos, which yeah. I didn't know any better. And yeah. because I didn't know a lot about writing, you know, as evidenced by my first four books. Yeah. But, well, but, I, during, but during those failures, I went and I bought every book I could find on how to write a novel. And I started doing my research and I started learning about all of the the skills you need to mm -hmm. master the craft of writing. Yeah. So I learned that. But, you learned that. But still not not enough because I published this thing with typos all over the place. Well, listen, <laughs> I, I was told by my editor um, in, in, in the publisher that I worked with when I did my book that, um, and he, by the way, has published hundreds of people. He himself has uh, worked and, and published 12 books. And he says that no matter how many times you have to, you go oh, through yeah. it, um, he has found all. that you don't get them all. Yep. Uh, that you still right. have. Um, I actually have, um, I had Tim McGraw's, um, Tim McGraw's keyboard player on, mm -hmm. uh, Jeff McMahon. And um he is obviously friends with Tim McGraw, but he also knew Tim's dad, um, the baseball player. 
um, and I, his name is escaping me, but mm-hmm. he, um, they had, uh, they had um, written, he, he had, they had the autobiography and after it had been released and they were going into a second printing, Jeff actually found a typo that was yeah, that, kind of like, um, that's the worst, a terrible, and it was a terrible, like the word that was in there was not the word that you really wanted. <laughs> So Jeff talks about that in that episode with yeah. with um, with us. So it really was something that uh, was unbelievable when it came yeah. to you know th- this writing. Um, yeah. But tell me a little bit more about um, what did it feel like when you first published your book. So you know it's pretty neat ordering your your author copy and opening the Amazon package and mm-hmm. you pull out your book. Yeah. You know, that's that's a really powerful moment. And, and I've worked it with is. a number of kids. One of the interesting things that happened when I wrote these books is kids started sending me their stories. Wow. And so Amazing. I posted it. I made a fan fiction page on my website. OK, I think you have the link to that. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, um, so I probably have a thousand stories on my website and they still keep coming wow. in. I get a couple of hundred a year. That's amazing and, because you're creating an environment in which kids are really putting themselves out there and recapturing yeah. the love for reading and writing. That's yep. great. And because they're writing about Minecraft, they're already mm-hmm. a content expert. So they don't yeah. have the fear of being wrong. Mm, Where wow. when you're writing that Huck Finn essay in class. Yes, of course. Right, and you didn't <laughs> read the whole thing and you're trying to figure out how to write this paper mm-hmm. and, you know. That's yeah. that's scarier for people than writing about something you know everything about and kids know yeah. everything about Minecraft. Absolutely. So, um, so, so many kids sent so me stories funny. that were 20, 30,000 words long. Really? And so I tell them, you can self-publish. These. You can the self-publish. rule on Amazon is you yeah. have to have at least 24 pages. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They don't care how big the font is. They don't care mm-hmm. what's on the pages. You got to have 24 pages. Wow. So one boy, the youngest kid that I helped with this was eight years old and every paragraph was a page and the font was like 56 point or something. Wow. But he didn't care because mm-hmm. he was a self-published author and he could point to Amazon and show people his name. And it was a huge self-esteem boost for him. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Crazy. You know, I think that I, I, the business coach in me, of course, is already thinking, wow, this could be a really fun niche for you to um, create a, maybe a course where parents and kids work together to self-publish their our art. So I don't know, just just right. my my brain where it goes no, immediately, I, you know, I, I, I've thought of that before, but. It takes me away from what I like to do. And I like to write. And you like to write. I love that. Amazing. I think that this is one of the things that um, it is so important to be able to um, do what we love. And now, again, as as an award-winning, best-selling author, um, what was the journey? And and how did you begin to get recognized? Are you working with a publisher now? What is that process like? So I had a publisher call me and said, do you want to be traditionally published with mm-hmm. your books? And I said, yes. And then like a couple of days later, an agent called me and said, do you need representation? And I said, yeah, I don't know anything about publishing. They said, wow. great. We'll, we'll find you a publisher. I said, you don't have to, I already got one. Amazing. So <laughs> I pointed them together and the agents thinking this is the easiest deal ever. This is the biggest thing ever. Yeah. That's awesome. I and love it. So they it. signed me for a contract for three books. Okay. Okay, I had, great. had the second one already done. While mm-hmm. I was finishing the third one, it was kind of funny. The editor called me up and said, hey, Mark, sales are good. Don't mm-hmm. kill the bad guy. We need another series. Wow. Said, oh, okay. okay. Well, okay. that happened like three times where they kept calling mm-hmm. me and say, we need another series. Don't okay. kill the bad guy. Um, but I had the agent and the agent didn't have to do much because when the publisher said, we need another series. I'd call the agent and say, hey, they're sending over a contract. And she'd say, okay. And then she'd do the contract and boom, yeah. it's done. So, so this was so the easiest thing in the world. Amazing. Um, but I want you to, you know, and I, and again, we've had other individuals who have worked with agents and a publisher. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about um, what does your agent do? What does the publisher do? Um, because I know that there's some people who are curious in this process. Mm-hmm. So 
typically a publisher won't talk to an author because a lot of people are out there writing books like me with my first four books. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought those were the greatest pieces of literature ever written. Mm. And they were terrible, terrible, terrible things written yeah. so poorly, but they don't want to waste their time looking at that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so the, the editor, the agent is the filter that the agent will look at stuff. And if they think it's good enough, because the agent doesn't get paid unless the book sells. Wow. Okay. And so they only want to work on things they think will sell. Mm -hmm. So that makes them very careful about who they decide to represent. Yeah. So publishers trust them more. Yeah, of course. And, and now, so, how did you go about? And again, the pub, the the agent reached out to you, but before that, you were reaching out to agents. How did you yeah. find them? So there's books that have lists of agents. Mm -hmm. There's always a book that's published every year, the list of agents yeah. in the industry. Um, there's lots of websites that have them. Mm -hmm. Agent Query is the big one. Yeah. And what you do is you write what's called a query letter. Mm hmm where you basically give them three paragraphs. You tell them a paragraph about you mm -hmm. and or you give them some, some opening paragraph and hopefully you know them or you met them or you can mention these are some books you represented and they're similar to mine. Yeah, amazing. If the, if the agent represents Stephen King and his spooky books <laughs> and I'm pitching them, well, they're not interested in my book. Yeah, of course. Because agents like to represent books they want to read. Yeah. And Absolutely. so you got to find somebody that does books similar to yours. And so you <laughs> write that opening paragraph, then you write a paragraph about your story mm -hmm. and give them a, a hint of what it's about. And then you write a paragraph about you, about your publication history. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, that last paragraph was hard to write because I didn't have anything. <laughs> and so you kind of fake your way through it. Um, but that's hard. And I've been told by other agents that they can read these letters and by the writing in the letter, they know if that person can be a professional author or not. Really? Incredible. Just by the, the prose that's in there, which is why I failed so many times because I wrote like a physicist. Right. You were writing like a physicist. I, I was yeah. delivering information in the most efficient way possible, rather than showing my skill mm -hmm. in how I can create prose. And wow. I never understood that. Yeah. And I still, think it, I understand it. And after those 24 books were done, I stopped writing Minecraft books. And mm -hmm. my agent and I split up because okay. she never really liked, I, I don't know that she liked the kind of books I wrote. Mm, gotcha. Um, and she got stuck with me and she made a lot of money getting stuck mm -hmm. with me. Right. But now for books that that I wanted her to try to go sell, she was not making any inroads anywhere mm -hmm. because the editor she worked with did the kind of books that she likes to represent. Gotcha. But not the and, ones that you were writing. Right. And so got it. We, we parted friends mm -hmm. and... I thought I have this great publication history and I got this great book facing the beast within. I'm going to go shop mm -hmm. it around to agents. Right. And I was totally unsuccessful. Mm. I couldn't find anybody who was interested in a book about anxiety. You know, it is such a, uh, it, it is such a terrible thing in, especially because anxiety is such a commonality now, especially after the pandemic. Um, yeah. I think that people's anxiety level, children's anxiety level has definitely uh, increased and it's on the rise. And Facing the Beast Within, again, is a book that is helping not only parents, but educators and kids themselves. Um, yeah. And as as I looked, you know, Cameron has a big problem and he struggles with anxiety and that's your main yeah. character. And again, he is a small sixth grader at summer camp and the story just evolves from there. Um, tell me a little bit of, of um, what has been kind of your intention now with this book. So I I know because my son, I wrote this because of my son's anxiety. Mm. and. A few years ago, I asked him, what did it really feel like when you were having these incredibly horrific panic attacks every yeah. day? 
What mm-hmm. what did it feel like in your yeah. head, in your body? And the level of hopelessness and despair he described for me mm-hmm. that he was feeling every day was just shocking. Wow. And so I wrote the book because I wanted other kids to realize they're not alone. Yeah. Because when and- we were struggling with this, our family, we were focused inwards. We were focused on my son. We were focused mm-hmm. on what can we do today to make it better? And wow. We were never successful. It just got worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And we felt like we were alone in this. And Mm. so we wanted somehow we, we, I wanted to tell other kids and other parents that they're not alone. Yeah. But at the same time, and so I wrote it and I gave it to my agent. This was the last one she tried to sell. Okay. It was not successful. And it took, she had it for maybe two years. And then I finally said, maybe we should do something different. Mm -hmm. And I took it back and I rewrote it. And then I gave it to a team of child psychologists and they read it and they gave me all their coping strategies, breathing exercises, terminologies they use with their patients. Mm -hmm. All of that I put into the story. Wow. So when a kid reads the book, they're going to hear what their parent, what their therapist is telling them. Right. Because we're I'm using the same terminology their therapist is going to use. Mm-hmm. And parents, I know for us, we'd go to these sessions with my son, with the therapist, and we'd usually sit there for 10 or 15 minutes, and then they'd kick us out, and then they'd the therapist would work with my son. Mm-hmm. And I never saw them practicing the coping strategies. Mm. I, I didn't know anything about that. Yeah. And so my main tool when I was helping my son get to school was to distract him. Right. You know, we'd listen to audio books going in. We'd listen to, to funny music. You know, he was a fan of little shop of horror. So we'd listen mm-hmm. to that going in and sing the lyrics. Um, cool. And uh, so for me as a parent, if I had had this book, this enables me to see Cameron struggling with anxiety and then apply the coping strategies, and it's described in detail what he's doing in there. Mm-hmm. I, that would have been so helpful when we yeah. were struggling with this. I think that this is such a great tool, you know, for parents and and children and, and young adults. Uh, uh, you know, and and this intersection of dealing with their struggles. I know yeah. that many times, you know, parents are trying to do the best they can, but they themselves weren't necessarily taught some yeah. of these things. And the coping strategies are so um, needed. And, you know, this is one of the reasons I, I became a social emotional learning facilitator because social emotional learning is one of these ways in which kids can learn some um, to be aware of what they're feeling, understand how to be able to manage some of these emotions, create uh, relationships with others that are helpful and useful yeah. as opposed to, you know, toxic relationships. And these are skills that if we can practice um, when we're young, then we can continue to grow and utilize in our lives in, in situations that we will encounter as adults. And and I know kids with anxiety are never going to be cured. Yeah. Right. They're yeah. always going to have it. They just have to learn to cope with it through their life. And learning mm-hmm. earlier rather than trying to figure it out later. Yeah. It's oh. probably easier. Yeah. So incredible. Amazing. Um, for the parents that are listening, what is the one thing that you want them to know about um, coming out on the other side um, of a child that is dealing with anxiety? I think uh, the thing to recognize is, first of all, it is a bleak, bleak journey mm-hmm. because yeah. you watch your child suffer every day mm-hmm. right. and you feel like a failure because you mm-hmm. can't protect them. Right. And oh, absolutely. this isn't really, I have learned isn't really discussed amongst parents, mm-hmm. but everybody I've spoken to says the same thing. They say, oh, I feel like a failure too. Yeah. And everybody feels like that. And we're not, we're doing the best we can, Yeah. but you have to keep trying something new when the things you're doing don't work. Yeah. And it's important to be able to normalize what it's going on. I think that a lot of people um, don't understand that normalization of of what is happening, what they're undergoing through is is crucial as they yeah. as they deal with this. Yeah. For, for me, feeling like a failure didn't help 
yeah. me help my son. Yeah, it absolutely. Made me less effective. Now, do you consider yourself a success now? Um, well, you know, it's funny with this book, it's achieved a lot of critical success acclaim, mm-hmm. right? It's winning lots of awards. The reviews are just fantastic. Yeah. Sales are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> because yes. when you self-publish something on Amazon, yeah, it's hard to be on the first page of the search engine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that takes a lot of effort and usually a lot of money to get up there. Yeah, and well, so I know what it is like to publish. I was lucky enough to be able to hit number one in several different categories, but I'm not in the first page anymore, right? Yeah. I was just uh, uh, on on the launch, but I think that we need to get the word out there in this incredible book and the work that you're doing. Um, what is what is in the future for you, Mark? What are you hoping so, to continue to do as a writer, as a parent, as a advocate for kids dealing with anxiety? So I'm working on book two in the series. <laughs> Um, right. That's probably going to be out in the mid middle of next year. It'll probably be done by the new year, mm-hmm. but then I'll send it out to get what are referred to as trade reviews. Gotcha. So a review from places like Kirkus and Book Life and some mm-hmm. of these big review places that yeah. you pay 500 bucks and you give them your story and you might get a good review or you might get blasted. They don't pull any punches. They don't pull, but that's a you know incredible because I think that it's great to get that credibility behind you as well, right? And so I'll do yeah. that. I'll submit it for a bunch of awards again, probably. <laughs> great. Um, and then I'll work on the third book and finish the series. Mm-hmm. And then I'm likely I I enjoy writing about mental health issues mm-hmm. because it gives me the chance to learn about it, right? But I know kids are struggling. And this gives me a chance to help kids. And that's Mm -hmm. the educator in me still that if I can help kids, I want to help kids. Absolutely. Once a teacher, always a teacher. (laughs) Yeah. And so I'll try to work on something else with another series, maybe with Cameron as the main character, maybe not. Maybe not. How well they sell. Um, well, amazing. And by the way, um, you know, this is definitely um, a great story that I think that can definitely be able to bring you and your children together. Again, um, the novel is Facing the Beast Within, and you also have Cameron and the Shadows of Wrath. Did I read that correctly? The Cameron and the Shadow Wraiths. Wraiths, is the got it. Book. Okay. Got it. And the third book, I think, is going to be called The Gargoyle's Revenge. Oh, that sounds amazing. I love it. Um, But you have some, again, incredible fan stories, the fan fiction. You have um, some information on Minecraft in here, again, so that parents can navigate a little bit of this uh, world. And they have all of these books that they can share with their kids as well. Uh, You have um, some some incredible content and and really great resources. I, I know that you also do appearances as well. Is this something that if you, if you have a group of parents or a community, something that you would be interested in doing that maybe people can reach out to you? Well, what, what I've been doing is I've been going to a lot of schools recently. Amazing. And libraries and bookstores. Mm-hmm. And that tends to be where I do the appearances. Great. Um, yeah, this so is I'm so doing great. a lot of those to promote the book. Because I know if moms hear about this book, mm-hmm. they'll get it for their anxious child. And word's going to spread and uh, it's going to help other kids. Yeah. You know, readers are leaders. So I encourage parents to go and and make sure that they're supporting their uh, children, become readers and continue to, you know, there's such vast worlds that we can be exposed to when we Trans, trans uh, transport ourselves through the books, and that I love that. I yep. have always enjoyed reading, and it's con- it continues to be something that I I love. And you know, sometimes I don't have enough time to read as much as I'd like to. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, Mark, do you anticipate maybe ever wandering into the adult fiction or into the self help um, part of? Um, so. It's uh, I'm not sure I know how to do the self-help part. Okay. Um, 
I like writing to kids because they're not as critical about your writing. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> uh, they just want to go on an exciting, immersive adventure. Mm. And I figured out how to do that. Yeah. Uh, adults are a lot more critical about the writing. And so I'm a little afraid that I'd get beat up some there. Mm-hmm. Even though yeah. I think I got pretty good writing chops. But yeah, I, I um, listen, 27 books. You are really um one of these incredible authors prolific amazing many of us you know are just one in in dream of the second but haven't gotten around to it so yeah. kudos to you for following this dream and for continuing to um be a creator that is making an impact in the lives of others and and through the work that you're doing um again i love all of the things that you are um, putting in in for people out there how to plan a story, uh, the physical effects of emotions, character design, writing an awesome hook. Yeah. These are so some I, of the resources that you have, and I think that these are really really cool. So so I made those writing tutorials mm-hmm. on my website markshevertoncom If you click on writing tips, mm-hmm. you get to that page. Yeah. And I wrote these because the stories I was getting from kids was always guy with sword. <laughs> hacking, hacking at zombies and it was always a battle scene and it was just somebody hacking away at it right and well there's a strategy to how you choreograph a battle mm, scene yes of course and so one of the writing tutorials in there is the anatomy of a battle scene yeah and you know i i wrote these for kids so that they could mm-hmm. learn more about writing and improve their writing and i was surprised mm. that a lot of elementary school teachers use these in their classrooms. That's so great. Well, amazing resources. I know that we have a lot of teachers that listen to the show as well. So hopefully they can connect with you, maybe bring you to their yep. schools and um, leverage some of your expertise and, and um, great content as well and partner with you and hopefully impact the lives of the students that they are teaching through Again, giving them a resource like your books and again, facing the beast within, which is an incredible book. We all need something like this. We need to find the ways of destroying that anxiety and and, and facing it and really having a clear plan. You did a great job at researching this and having the resources from uh, top experts in here. So um, I appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, Tell us again. And where people can find you. So my website, MarkSheverton.com, and that's C-H-E-V-E-R-T-O-N. And you'll see information about my book. You'll see the fan fiction page and the mm-hmm. uh, writing tutorials there. And right. if a kid wants to send me their story, all they got to do is put it in an email and send mm. it to me. And Amazing. if they click the fan fiction page, there's a tool right on the sidebar that you can p- paste your story in. And I, I was surprised at how much writing was a therapeutic tool for me when my, mm-hmm. we were struggling with my son's anxiety. Yeah. And maybe if kids are having trouble with anxiety, maybe mm-hmm. they need to put quill to parchment and they need to make up a story. That's and right. They can send it to me and I'll put it on my website. It's a kid safe place. I love People it. Comment on it. But all the comments are approved by me. So anybody who's mm-hmm. mean and disrespectful gets banned. Well, I love that. I love that you are really creating a safe space. You know, writing is definitely a therapeutic thing. Um, At the beginning of the pandemic, my niece, uh, she's 10 now, um, but definitely, you know, she was seven at the time. And that was the one thing that I don't live near her. She lives in Florida. I'm here in Connecticut. But we we started to write a story together to kind Mm -hmm. of describe, you know, her experience. And it really was one of the ways that I knew that could help kind of navigate the experiences and the emotions that as everybody was feeling, correct? (laughs) So, yeah, Yeah. I love it. Well, I encourage parents to have their kids send me a story. I love it. Well, I am so thrilled and honored that you came here. Um, Mark, what an incredible uh, thing you're doing. And always, always, you have an open invitation to come back and to chat (laughs) some more. I can't wait to see what amazing new series you're going to write and how you continue to make an impact in the world and helping others go confidently in the direction of your dreams. Thanks again. Thank you. 
Thanks for listening to Casa de Confidence. We thank you for listening. And if you want more, go to casadeconfidencepod.com. Check Julie out on her socials as Julie DeLuca Collins. And you can also check out her website at goconfidentlycoaching.com. Have a great week. And don't forget, go confidently in the direction of your dreams. Hi, everybody. I know that sometimes we get very lonely in this entrepreneur journey. And I want to invite you to join us into our limited time only purposeful you mastermind. For many of us entrepreneurs, we believe that we can do it all. But the reality is that doing it alone only creates a lot of overwhelm. So join us at the purposeful you mastermind. You can find out more information by going to bit.ly forward slash Julie's mastermind. This is going to be the place where you are able to then unlock your full potential and achieve long-term success for your business, push you behind your current limits, expand your connections, discover new ideas, and implement them with confidence. You're going to get the support in all aspects and transforming you to the six-figure business you've been looking for. Pause and get off the hamster wheel if you've been spinning around. This is a time where you can get that support from like-minded entrepreneurs that are here to join you in your journey. Together, we can challenge the assumptions and land the speaking engagements and opportunities we want to grow our business and make an impact in the lives of people. See you then. Remember, you can find the mastermind at bit.ly, Julie's Mastermind.